I was born in Dr. Nalika's nursing home on August the 15th, 1947. And the time, the time matters too. Well, then at night. No, it's important to be more. On the stroke of midnight, as a matter of fact, clock hands joined palms in respectful greeting as I came. Oh, spell it out, spell it out. At the precise instant of India's arrival at independence, I tumbled forth into the world. At the stroke of the midnight hour, when the world sleeps, India will awake to life and freedom. A moment comes, which comes but rarely in history, when we step out from the old to the new, when an age ends, and when the soul of a nation, long suppressed, finds utterance. It is fitting that at this solemn moment we take the pledge of dedication to the service of... At the moment of India's independence, August the 15th, 1947, 1,001 babies are born. Salman Rushdie's book is the fictional and altogether fantastic autobiography of one of these children of midnight, Salim Sinai. His family saga collides with 30 years of troubled Indian history. It probably grew out of a family joke, which is that I, mean, I was born two and a half months before the British left, and, and there was this joke that there was some relationship between the two events. Um, and I, when I sat down to compose the book, I just thought it would be funnier to make it exact. Um, and so the book really does arise out of that insane coincidence, and then and then suggests that there's something magical in that and that the child and the country become twins. It seemed to me that the first 30 years of independent India represented something like an age in the history of the country. It sort of had a shape. And that shape is also part of the shape of the book. Independence, partition, Pakistan, Bangladesh, the Indo-Pakistan War, Indira Gandhi's emergency, famine, Sterilization, medicine, magic, superstition. It's all in the book. And it's Salim's fantasy that he has somehow dreamed up modern India, a part comic, part tragic hallucination of his brain. He tells his story to a companion, Padma, who hovers by his desk. Salim works in a pickle factory. A cook, you gasp in horror. A Khan Sama merely. How is it possible? And I grant such mastery of the multiple gifts of cookery and language is rare indeed, yet I possess it. It was really a device for discussing the relationship between private lives and, and public lives, and public affairs. And Salim believes comically that history is his fault and sets out over the course of a quarter of a million words to prove it. You are amazed. But then I'm not, you see, one of your 200 rupees a month cookery, John, is but my own master, working beneath the saffron and green winking of my personal neon goddess. And my chutneys and kasundis are, after all, connected to my nocturnal scribblings. By day, amongst the pickle vats, by night, within these sheets, I spend my time at the great work of preserving. Memory as well as fruit, is being saved from the corruption of the clocks. I was born in Bombay, um, in the house that I use in the book, really. Uh, the, probably the most autobiographical thing in the book is the places in it. I mean, the house in the book is the house that I grew up in, and the school that Salim goes to is the school that I went to. And the bit of Bombay that the book knows is the bit that I grew up in. Um, and Bombay, I think, was, a, was another major motivation in the book, was to deal with Bombay, because it's a very strange city. It was a very exciting city to be a child in. It's always been unlike the rest of India. And people from Bombay think of themselves as being unlike people from elsewhere. It is the city of India, although it's not the capital. It has more non-Indians living in Bombay than anywhere else, than, than anywhere, any other part of India does. It has a great mixture of Indians, and, and it acts as a magnet. And so you get people from all over the subcontinent there. You get every single religion that there is in India. Um, and the curious effect of that is it makes it a very secular city, I mean, because, there are, because everybody's there with all their different beliefs. It's really impossible to be brought up rigidly within any one set of beliefs. 
Yeah. What's, what, how were you brought up with, with the, well, the English and the Indian? How did they... Well, I mean, well my family was, was Muslim, but, but not particularly um, orthodox. I mean, uh, they, weren't, I mean they, were, they believed in God and so forth, but they never rammed it down my throat. And so I was really brought up in a very secular atmosphere, and I, I, I played with, with children from all different religions and countries and so forth, because that's, they were all living, they were my neighbours. I think the country in which you're a child is the country which, to which you belong in a way that you never belong to another one. And, and so in that sense, I'm more Indian than anything else. You were also had a, you came from a, an upper middle class family, you mm -hmm. had a, a, a well-off background. Yes. In other words, you would have been closer to some extent to British culture than in India than you yes. would have been to... and especially in Bombay, which anyway is very close to British culture. And I went to a British mission school. Rushdie uses his own experiences, but he'll often exaggerate or caricature. For instance, he gives his hero, Salim, an enormous nose, later used to sniff out corruption. It's a favourite target of Zagalo, the geography master. I'm being led by my hair to the front of the class. See, boys, you see what you have here. Regard, please, this hideous face of this primitive creature. It reminds you of, and the eager responses, Sir, the devil, sir, uh, please, sir, one cousin of mine, uh, no, sir, uh, a vegetable, sir, I don't know which, until Zagalo, shouting above the tumult, Silence, sons of baboons. This object here, a tug on my nose, this is human geography. How, sir, where, sir, what, sir? Zagalo is laughing now. You don't see Higafors in that face of this ugly ape. You don't see the whole map of India. Yes, sir. No, sir. You show us, sir. See here the Deccan Peninsula hanging down again. Ouch, my nose. Sir, sir, if that's the map of India, what are the stains, sir? Sniggers, titters from my fellows, and Zagalo taking the question in his stride. These stains, he cries, are Pakistan. This birthmark on the right ear is the east wing, and these are horrible stained left cheek. The west, remember, uh, stupid boys, Pakistan is a stain on the face of India. Oh, oh, the class laughs. Absolute master joke, sir. There's a sense of the voice telling you a story, which is quite unlike the tradition of, of the English novel that we're mm. used to today. Yeah, well, I think probably I should start by saying that the, that the novel is not an indigenous form in India. I mean, there's not really a long history of prose fiction. Um, it more or less arrived with the British. And, and now there are language, English language and Hindi and other languages, uh, novels in India. But it's not really, I mean, it's a grafted form rather than one that grew there. Um, the form that is indigenous is, is tale-telling, storytelling, fables. And that's been there forever. And from the ancient narrative verse epics, like the Mahabharata, Ramayana and so forth, and through there's the India's own version of Aesop's fables, which are called the Panchatantra stories. So there's an oral storytelling tradition which every village knows about. People gather around and, and old men with white beards tell stories. I mean, Were you told uh, stories as a child by old men with white beards? Not, not old men with white beards, but my father, yes. Uh, my father used to tell me the stories as bedtime stories. And I mean, I don't know now how many he made up and how many he was simply retelling that previously existed, but those stories were important for me because they were a lot of the sort of seed material for the way I think about storytelling. Um, because I think, you see, that realism in the novel, even in England, is relatively recent, and, and realism in storytelling in India never existed. But there was a, a sort of belief that stories should clearly be lies, and they should clearly be untrue, they should be wonderful tales, um, and that they didn't have to conform to the descriptions of the literal world. It's a child's eye view of India, and like a fairy story, Rushdie gives Salim and the other Midnight's children magical powers. Salim can mind travel across the subcontinent at will, entering the head and sharing the thoughts of any of India's 600 million inhabitants. At one time, I was a landlord in Uttar Pradesh, my belly rolling over my pyjama cord as I ordered serfs to set my surplus grain on fire. 
I occupied briefly the mind of a Congress party worker, bribing a village schoolteacher to throw his weight behind the party of Gandhi and Nehru in the coming election campaign. Also, the thoughts of a Catalan peasant who had decided to vote communist. My daring grew. One afternoon, I deliberately invaded the head of our own state chief minister, uh, which was how I discovered over twenty years before it became a national joke that Maraji Desai took his own water daily. I was inside him, tasting the warmth as he gurgled down a frothing glass of urine. And finally, I hit my highest point. I became Jawaharlal Nehru, Prime Minister and author of framed letters. I sat with the great man amongst a bunch of gap-toothed, straggle-beard astrologers and adjusted the five-year plan to bring it into harmonic alignment with the music of the spheres. The high life is a heady thing. The function of astrologers in Indian politics I mean, continues to the present day because Nehru had his personal astrologer always. And indeed, this, there is a story that, that before one of the Indian economic five-year plans was presented, the astrologers had to approve it. Um, and now Indira Gandhi has her own personal astrologer, who's, who's apparently a very, very powerful man in, in Delhi, and who more or less can decide what she does and doesn't do. And she's very... I mean, it's, it's, it's an extraordinary thing that this great ruling family of India, which is extremely westernized, I mean, Nehru was educated at Harrow, and, should, at the same time as being these sort of arch-rationalists, also have their tame astrologers who they actually believe in. A childhood spent in India, followed by the sudden uprooting to an English public school. That was also Rushdie's experience when he was sent to rugby at the age of 14. Well, I came in 61, so just 20 years and a bit ago. I mean, really, because two middle-class Indians of my parents' generation, the British public school, was the acme of educational possibility. And so they decided that they wanted me to go to one and, and sent me. So I went to rugby, unfortunately. I mean, really, I think rugby was a kind of radicalizing experience for me because I arrived at rugby, as you say, as a kind of child of a privileged Indian family and, and probably quite snobbish and all that. And, and rugby knocked it out of me by the simple business of showing me that I was an outsider. And, and treating me like a foreigner, and, and I had a certain amount of um, racist trouble with people writing slogans on the wall of my room and tearing up my essays for me and nice things. And suddenly I realised that I didn't actually belong to this ethic, um, and as a result hated the school. It's in a way silly of me to call myself an outsider in this society because I've lived here for 20 years and married it, you know, and I, I speak like this. Um, and I dress like this, you know, and it's in many senses, I'm not an outsider. But there is a bit of me that isn't English, and I think it's a very useful thing to have. India is a huge uh, continent. What, what did you think England was like, what it looked like? Well, I mean, I had a very sort of cliche movie image of England, of little patchwork fields and so forth, which, I mean, actually it is like. Um, and certainly there is the, the, the obvious contrast between India and England, which is that India, by and large, is not green. The other thing, of course, is the countryside is a very different shape, because in India you have that classic very low horizon, very wide horizon. Um, and also it's never empty in India. And for instance, once on an Indian train, um, I did, did an experiment of timing how long went by when I didn't see anyone outside the window. And there was never more than 15 seconds you know, on, a, on a sort of eight or nine hour train journey. Um, there was always somebody there in the absolutely deserted rural countryside. There were, there were always people. And, and that sort of idea of multitude, the fact that you were never away from people, and, and the, you know, completely alters things like the meaning of privacy, because you literally aren't alone, ever. Um, and privacy is a kind of luxury of rich people in India. Um, because, uh, I mean, for instance, people always come and um, urinate and, and shit you know, next to the railway line and wave at the train as it goes past. You, you, did you go on a lot of trains as a child? I went on quite a few, yes, because I mean, my father originally came from Delhi, and so he every so often used to take me on trips to Delhi with him. Um, 
and they were very exciting things because Indian trains are, are just much more extraordinary things than anything in Europe. There's a, a sort of motif in the novel where I talk about fare dodgers. What people do is they wait just beyond the platform and leap onto the outside of the train before it's really gathered speed and then cling on and hammer on the doors and ask to be let in very piteously. Insiders and people who are outsiders. In fact, there's quite often large numbers of them clinging on, so if you actually are fool enough to open the door, you get this invasion of 18 or 19 people who frequently have gun belts, knives and things, and in other ways, alarming. So basically, you don't open the door, and, and you, you, get, you travel along with this hammering going on on the door, you know there's somebody hanging on outside your window, but you don't let them in. And in the novel, um, all through the novel, whenever, whenever anybody goes on a train, there are fare dodgers outside hammering to be let in. And always, in all the trains in this story, there were these voices and these fists banging and pleading in the frontier mail to Bombay and in all the expresses of the years. And it was always frightening. Until at last, I was the one on the outside, hanging on for dear life and begging, hey, Maharaj, let me in, great sir. Yeah, well, I mean, the railway is, is really, is, is unbelievably important in India, and much more so than it is in any Western country, because it is basically what holds the country together. Everything travels on the railway, not on the roads, really. They are very wonderful trains, and not only wonderful trains, but they're wonderful railway stations. Um, because in India, the railway station is, is one of the great focuses of life, and people don't go to the railway station just to travel. I mean, people go to the railway station to go and meet their friends, you know, and, there are, and there's a whole... I mean, an Indian railway station is, is a sort of microcosm of the country. The central thing about India, I think, is that it's a, it's a very multitudinous place, and if you want to reflect that in a book, the book has to, has to contain multitudes. Um, what I used as, a, as the way of understanding that huge amount of material was the image that I started, that probably I had before anything else, was the image of a hole in a sheet um, through which a doctor had to examine a woman who was in parda and therefore couldn't be gazed upon by the eyes of mere men, even if they were doctors. In the very centre of the sheet, a hole had been cut, a crude circle, about seven inches in diameter. Dr. Saab, my daughter is a decent girl, it goes without saying. She does not flaunt her body under the noses of strange men. You will understand that you cannot be permitted to see her. No, not in any circumstances. Accordingly, I have required her to be positioned behind that sheet. There was a story like this that happened to my grandfather, who was a doctor, although otherwise dissimilar from the doctor in the book. Um, who went to visit a friend of his who'd got married and, um, and had to examine the wife of this friend through a, a perforated sheet because she couldn't, you know, it would be shameful for her to be revealed in her full glory to this doctor. And so the, the afflicted part was put against the hole in the sheet and he had to examine her with the stethoscope through it. And so I used that and exaggerated it as a device in the book. And the doctor in the book, the grandfather in the book, falls in love with his wife because he um, threw a perforated sheet, because he literally goes to see her over a period of years and each time sees a different piece of her and, and gradually builds this, this jigsaw of a, of, of a sort of partitioned woman. And there, in the sheet, weakening the eyes of Adam, as is, hung a superbly rounded and impossible buttock. And now, as is, is it permitted that... Whereupon a word from Rani... An obedient reply from behind the sheet. A drawstring pulled, the pyjamas fall from the celestial rump, which swells wondrously through the hole. Adam, as is, forces himself into a medical frame of mind, reaches out, feels, and swears to himself in amazement that he sees the bottom reddening in a shy but compliant blush. And that is anyway a kind of comic beginning for the book, but more than that is a, is a metaphor for the way in which the book is thereafter structured, um, which is the world seen in fragments, that you, you, you see little pieces of, of, of the country as, as it were through a hole in a sheet. Um, 
and gradually they, they sort of glue together into some kind of composite portrait of the thing you've never seen entirely. And I think, anyway, that's a, that's a pretty accurate description of the way in which people see the world, that you, you very rarely see everything or know everything about the society in which you live. You see pieces of it, you, you know bits of it, and you, there are other bits you don't know, and you try and infer from the bits you know what the rest of it is like, and you try and make a coherent shape, in other words, and sometimes you're right and sometimes you're wrong. Can I have a kiss, please? Just bought a kiss, which they insisted on giving me under plain wrapper. Here it is, this daring object. Um, just goes to show you can get away with a lot more in the Indian movies nowadays. Never done this in my day. Better cover it up again, I think. In those days, it was not permitted for lover boys and their leading ladies to touch one another on screen for fear that their osculations might corrupt the nation's youth. But the 33 minutes after the beginning of the Lovers of Kashmir, the premier audience began to give off a low buzz of shock because Pierre and Nayar had begun to kiss. N not one another, but things. Pierre kissed an apple sensuously, with all the rich fullness of her painted lips, then passed it to Nayar, who planted upon its opposite face a virilely passionate mouth. This was the birth of what became to be known as the indirect kiss, and how much more sophisticated a notion it was than anything in our current cinema, how pregnant with longing and eroticism. Here we are in the world of the Bombay talkie. I think almost all of them are films made in Bombay. The Khwab means dream. It's almost the classic Indian film title, really, because that's what they all are. Kabi Kabi, which is up there on the hoarding, uh, means sometimes. And it's really what Kabi Kabi is one of the big hit movies of recent years. In Bombay, or certainly all over India, up above the cinema, they'd have giant cardboard painted hoardings and versions of these posters that are huge. And so it's easy actually in a way to laugh about these films because they're, they're relatively melodramatic and corny. Um, but the thing that's, that's important about them is they try and be sort of compendiums of human experience. They have, they have to have something of everything. So they have funny uncles and villains and fight sequences and uh, romance and songs and dances and really because the main market for these films is outside the cities and when people in the villages go to the films they really want the total entertainment and so the films try and be very inclusive in what they put in. Uh, and in a way, because I grew up with these films around me, um, I've tried to do some sort of literary version of that really in the book and also try and bring some all human life in. The bit in the book where Salim talks about going to the cinema during the month of fasting um, is literally true because we did occasionally as children have days where we fasted. I mean, it was quite exciting, actually. What would happen is that you'd wake up before sunrise and you'd have a light meal. And basically, if you were sensible, you'd, you'd eat things which contained a lot of liquid. I mean, it was relatively easy to do without food, but it was actually very difficult in, in hot weather not to drink anything. And the advantage of going to the movies is that the movies were air-conditioned, you see, and so they would be cool and you wouldn't be losing so much water. And also, they were a way of getting through this period when you weren't allowed to eat crisps or anything, you see. And so we used to be very keen on going to the movies during the month of fasting. My sister and I took it in turns, or sometimes called out in unison, to remind Aminar the 10.30 in the morning show. It's Metro Cup Club Day. Amar, please. Then 
the drive in the Rover to the cinema where we could taste neither Coca-Cola nor potato crisps, neither quality ice cream nor samosas in greasy paper, but at least there was the air conditioning, the cup club badges pinned to our clothes, and competitions and birthday announcements made by a compere with an inadequate moustache. And finally, the film. After the trailers with their introductory titles, next attraction and coming soon, and the cartoon, in a moment the big film, but first, Scaramouche, perhaps. <whistles> Swashbuckling, we'd say to one another afterwards, playing movie critic, and a rumbustuous bawdy rump, although we were ignorant of swashbuckles and bawdiness. If you think about what, what English means in India, it's very odd because India has so many languages that uh, as you travel around it, you, you as an Indian may well find that the way in which you can communicate with other Indians is through the language of the imperialist because it may be the thing you most have in common. Um, Indian English, of course, is not like English English. Uh, I mean, there was a wonderful incident when I went to India with, with my wife and she was talking to an Indian gentleman on a train and they were both speaking English to each other and neither of them thought they were speaking the same language as the other one. Um, they literally didn't understand each other and they had to go through me to interpret the same language to each other. So Indian English changes. We know what England has given to India, however mm. ambivalent that is. What has, what has England taken from India, would you say? Oh, money, I think, to begin with. Uh, large quantities of money, um, which went to build large buildings, um, you know, the homes of returning East India Company, Nawabs and so forth. I mean, India made a lot of Englishmen rich. There is this sort of notion around that the, that the British Empire was not profitable and that, you know, the white man's burden was an act of love, and, you know, to bring up the, the sullen, heathen people, you know. Um, but actually, lots of people made fortunes. Why are we going to, to Sezenko? Well, I don't really know, because I, I, I know very little about this place. Um, in fact, I've only ever just seen this photograph of it. Um, I mean, the reason I, I became interested in it is that I read a, a paragraph about it in a book, and what it seems to be is, is a mammoth folly built by a returning East India Company grandee called Charles Cockrell. Why it interests me is that it seems to be sort of fantasy house, really. It's a, it's, a, it's a way of bringing India into the Cotswolds. It's actually exactly what I hoped it would be like. I think it, it's very nice, actually, because it's, it's got a very strange ambiguity about it, I think, which is that it's the first place done with quite a lot of care and quite a lot of attention and obviously quite a lot of affection as well because they've got a lot of things right. I mean, like the little pavilions with the, with, with the gods in them and there's a little pavilion of the, of the sun god, the Hindu sun god Surya. And just tiny vistas you keep coming across of, of bridges and stepping stones underneath them and so forth. And I think one of the interesting things that I read about it was that his son, Charles Cockrell's son, who was also called Charles and was an architect himself, got very irritated at this place and, and, and um, turned against it and, and said that he thought it was a, a sort of paradigm of the British in India. He thought, he thought it was a sort of proof of the, how the British had this ability to sink themselves in a world of make-believe. And, and actually that's sort of what the British did in India. They went out there and lived their secret fantasies you know, of, of being wonderful, colourful people. And I think in a way that's a lot of the literature is to do with this, this make-believe world of India that the English wanted to know about. And put it this way, if, if, if this house were a book, uh, it wouldn't be E.M. Forster. You know, it would actually be the Far Pavilions. You know, it would actually be deeds of daring do and the glory that was India. 
The children's books of Rudyard Kipling give an inside picture of India that is closer in its strangeness to Rushdie's than the more detached views that have followed. I mean, I'd read the Jungle Books when I was a kid, and I, and I remembered liking the Jungle Books very much. Um, and I hadn't, at that point, understood that the monkeys were Kipling's satire of the Indians and so forth, and I just thought they were funny monkeys. You know. um, so, and then, you see, I was at school and so forth, and as I grew up, I got led to believe that Kipling was this, this evil person, that it was impossible to read properly, and one would wish to throw the books across the room and so forth. And so I just didn't bother, basically. Um, and then I just recently read quite a lot of Kipling and, and discovered that... I mean, it's, very, it's a very strange thing, because they're all right. I mean, Kipling does do things which make you want to throw the book across the room. And, and he was a sort of major racist and believed in the superiority of the, the English. And, but at the same time, I think that he also did some extraordinary things. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's sort of almost a truism to say that Kim is an astonishing novel about India. Um, and I think probably... I mean, of what I've read, it seems to be the other one which tried, which tried to do something similar to what I tried to do. I mean, it, uh, in the sense that it tried to be panoramic and it tried to be inclusive and, and, it, got, and it also tried to be not posh. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't to do with, with grand people and balls and things, but it was about, you know, the bazaars and the streets and the way in which the common life of India was lived. In Rushdie's India, the Europeans are generally consigned to the sidelines. But one scene, at Amritsar in the Punjab, is an exception. It's an important episode in the book, deliberately written without emotion. An English officer, Brigadier General Dyer, briefly and shamefully takes the centre of the stage. A large number of Indians gathered for a, a peaceful meeting in what's called a compound, a sort of open space called Jallianwalabar which is a very enclosed place, and to get into this place you have to go down a very narrow alleyway, and it's not a place from which you can flee because it's surrounded by buildings. When they were all in there, and there was no violence taking place, and there was simply an, a large assembly of people, which, which the martial law regulations had banned, so in that sense it was an infringement, um, Dyer arrived with 50 troops and opened fire on the crowd, and hundreds and hundreds of people were killed. Uh, and it's the effect of that event I mean, to this day, means that it's, it's very difficult for Indians to talk about Jalian Balabar still without feeling a kind of great wave of emotion about it. In Midnight's Children, Rushdie takes a quietly comic revenge on General Dyer. Salim's grandfather, unwittingly caught up in the atrocity, is saved by a sneeze. As the 51 men march down the alleyway, a tickle replaces the itch in my grandfather's nose. The 51 men enter the compound and take up positions, 25 to Dyer's right and 25 to his left. And Adam Aziz ceases to concentrate on the events around him as the tickle mounts to unbearable intensities. As Brigadier Dyer issues a command, the sneeze hits my grandfather full in the face. <laughs> he sneezes and falls forward, losing his balance, following his nose and thereby saving his life. There is a noise like teeth chattering in winter and someone falls on him. The chattering stops and is replaced by the noises of people and birds. There seems to be no traffic noise whatsoever. Brigadier Dyer's 50 men put down their machine guns and go away. They've fired a total of 1,650 rounds into the unarmed crowd of these, 1,516 have found their mark, killing or wounding some person. Good shooting, Dyer tells his men. We've done a jolly good thing. I think, you know, if you can say that single events change the course of history, it was probably the event that made the independence of India in the near future inevitable, because it, it's one of those events which, was, which created such a sense of outrage um, amongst Indians. Um, that nobody thought about the British in quite the same way afterwards. But the national flag, the saffron, white and green tricolour, was publicly unfurled. And for the rest, it was crowds, crowds, crowds. The occasion was the swearing-in of Lord Mountbatten as Governor-General of the Dominion of India. There is certainly is a very strong political idea in the book, and, and really, to put it simply, what it was is that, I, uh, that independence, despite 
the blood and the gore and the, and the terrible mistakes and the partitions and all that was nevertheless some kind of a time of optimism, that, that people felt a sense of possibility, that you know the imperialists had been removed and, and there was a new country that was their country. And, and people of my parents' generation all say that they felt this, that despite all the flaws in the event, it was an, a time of hope. And the argument of the book is that during the course of the next 30 years, that hope was not necessarily systematically betrayed, but betrayed. And that whatever the optimism that was represented, that that independence represented was, um, the next 30 years represented the annihilation of that optimism. This is why optimism occurs in the book as a disease. I mean, people catch it like an infection, and, and it keeps, they keep getting cured of it in, in various ways, but it keeps recurring. Um, and the children of midnight themselves are, are basically, I think, a metaphor of hope. I mean, that's what they're about. They're, about, they're a kind of embodiment of the hope of 1947. And when they get destroyed in the emergency, um, that, to me, was, a, was a, a symbol of the destruction of that, the good things about independence. Because I think, you see, it was a great and optimistic thing that a country like India should attempt democracy. It's much easier for rich countries to be democratic, and it's extremely difficult for poor ones to be democratic, because the, the stresses on a democracy are much greater when, the, when people don't eat. The Nehru family, the success story of modern India, over a span of 30 years, as the fortunes of his hero Salim decline, Rushdie presents a satirical version of the rise of the country's first family. In the case of Nehru, there was always this strange amb amb ambiguity in him, that he was on the one hand a democrat, and I'm sure that's true, I mean, despite all his, his leanings towards autocracy, he was basically a democrat. But at the same time, he was very interested in building the dynasty, um, and for instance, during his prime ministership, Indira Gandhi, who then didn't hold any kind of public office, um, was living in his house, being his hostess. And so when foreign heads of state came to visit, Nehru and Indira Gandhi would, would entertain them, and the foreign minister was frequently not invited. You see, so, so what he was doing was, was making sure that Indira Gandhi knew more about the world of international diplomacy than any other politician in India could ever hope to acquire. Indira Gandhi, the widow, as she's called in the book, obsesses Salim's imagination. She's an increasingly sinister presence in the story, a witch from a child's nursery rhyme. She first appears unnamed um, as the widow in a nightmare, um, which is actually a nightmare that I had. No colours, except green and black. The walls are green. The sky is black. There is no roof. The stars are green. The widow is green. But her hair is black as black. The widow sits on a high chair. The chair is green. The seat is black. The widow's hair has a centre parting. It is green on the left and on the right, black. There's this business about hairstyles. Um, I mean, the book uses hairstyles quite a lot. I mean, Indira Gandhi does have a large white streak on one side of her, her head and, and black on the other. And at that time, sometimes, she actually did look as though her hair was schizophrenic, that one side of it was white and the other side of it was black. And I suggest that there is a, an explanation in, um, to be found here for all, you know, for the nature of her government, that it, that it also had a, um, a white and open part and a black part. And, and for instance, to use to, you, to apply the terms to the economy, the black economy in India um, was believed at one point to be larger than the public or white economy. And so I use the hairstyle as a way of, of describing political facts. And it's also um, a pleasure in punning, really, in mischief. I mean, the centre parting and the centre party and... Uh... Yes. And so, I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's a joke, really. And I, I don't think that Indira Gandhi ever achieves in the book, you know, psychological depth. I mean, she's there as, as a sort of terror figure. And... In real life, I think, during the emergency, that's what she was for many people. Um, she became a kind of dragon goddess. You know. and I think there is a kind of correlation between what politicians want to do to, the soci to a society and what writers want to do to it. Um, and they both want to make it in their own image. You know. And um, 
writers do it rather more innocently by sitting in a room and putting it down on paper and politicians do it for real. But I think there is a clear co connection between the two people's, the two kinds of people's approach to the world. And so in the book, they, Salim, the scribbler, and Indira, the politician, become rivals because they're basically fighting for the same territory. Did Salim's dream of saving the nation leak through the osmotic tissues of history into the thoughts of the Prime Minister herself? Was my lifelong belief in the equation between the state and myself transmuted in the madam's mind into that, in those days, famous phrase, India is Indira and Indira is India? Were we competitors for centrality? Was she gripped by a lust for meaning as profound as my own? <laughs> and was that... Was that why? The book is basically a tragedy, um, but it's a tragedy written like a comedy. Um, I mean, the book ends badly, you know, or sadly, anyway, um, and it's a it's a kind of elegy for a, for childhood and for, um, as I was saying, optimism and so forth. So it's a sad book, uh, and I think the basic conception of it is is tragic, which is the idea that these magical children who came into being by the accident of the midnight hour of independence, sort of came into being in order to be destroyed. Um, and that's probably the central metaphor of the book. Symbolic value of the pickling process. All the 600 million eggs which gave birth to the population of India could fit inside a single standard-sized pickle jar. 600 million spermatozoa could be lifted on a single spoon. Every pickle jar, you will forgive me if I become florid for a moment, contains therefore the most exalted of possibilities. The feasibility of the chucknification of history, the grand hope of the pickling of time. I, however, have pickled chapters tonight by screwing the lid firmly onto a jar bearing the legend special formula number 30, abracadabra, I reach the end of my long-winded autobiography. In words and pickles, <laughs> I have immortalised my memories. When you pickle things, they don't remain as they were before they were pickled. Um, also, when you write about things, they don't remain exactly as they were before you wrote about them, because the pickling process changes them a bit. Is it a very particular art, the pickling? I mean, in other words, is different oh. people pickle differently? Oh, yes, there are great, there's a vast variety of pickles, and you can have hot ones and not-so-hot ones and sweet ones and sour ones and so forth. And then there, there are lots of different recipes. And there was actually an old lady in Bombay called Mrs. Fernandez who used to make these wondrous, legendary pickles that, that you never got except in Bombay and were famous. And her pickle factory is sort of in the book what you have to do in pickling is you have to put in a lot of vinegar and, and it alters it alters the flavour. And it says in the book somewhere that the art of doing it is to alter the flavour in degree but not in kind um, and that you can be forgiven a slight intensification of taste. One day, perhaps, the world may taste the pickles of history. They may be too strong for some palates. Their smell may be overpowering. Tears may rise to eyes. I hope, nevertheless, that it will be possible to say of them that they possess the authentic taste of truth. That they are, despite everything, acts of love.